Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another author commentary edition of the Planet Ripple Logs. Today's focus is Log 4, Recruitment, though I do want to note something that I forgot to last time. This bit where Minnow and Noma are first getting acquainted, and Noma mentions that Andrea once took care of her for like a couple months while she was recovering from a terrible injury. I wish I left that bit out. It doesn't really contribute much to the story, it never comes up again in all these years. It's just a shortcut to give these characters some kind of connection, something they could relate over. But it just ends up being one of those annoying Star Wars things, where every character is bumped into every other character at some point, and it just makes the world and the universe feel that much smaller. If I wrote this story today, I'd probably leave out that sort of thing. Log 4 opens with another info dump, this time about Merfolk. I've already gone over all of this in the Merfolk episode, so I won't repeat it here. If you want to pause, go watch that and come back, be my guest. The first half of this chapter is just Minnow meeting Kelsey and getting a job working a civilian Zoot. Zoots are what I call most of the machines in Planet Ripple that can be controlled like a giant robot, or in these ones' case, more like a forklift. And one of the first ones Minnow walks by is the same type that Andrea used. Not the exact same, most of its components are slightly different, but it's just similar enough to trigger her. Don't get sucked down, don't get sucked down! Those words are going to be a recurring thing until Volume 6, so keep that in mind. Minnow suffers PTSD. A lot. But at least in this case, Kelsey was able to distract her before it could get too bad. And these zoots really show how much Planet Ripple's design language has changed, how squarish and blocky the visuals used to be. They're much more curvy nowadays. A lot of machines look more organic, especially the pirate ones, to the point where some just look like the actual sea creatures they're based on made bigger. Though I'd say civilian ones like this are still pretty blocky even today. Operating it is simple enough that Minnow's able to get a job, though Kelsey may have also taken a little pity on her. Along with a few other perks, she gets a ration card, which is essentially their version of an EBT. So just like that, she has a job, but she still needs that kind of assistance to get by. Ain't that a mood. And now she's just wondering why he's suddenly being nice to her when he's hated her for so long. And his explanation... It, it doesn't make it okay. His actions towards Minnow until recently have been inexcusable, along with everybody on the ship who's been cruel to her. It's less about absolving Kelsey personally, and more about setting up some of the series' recurring themes. Scapegoating is very common in Planet Ripple. Little people are always blamed for big, systemic issues. And while Minnow isn't always the scapegoat, she is a lot of the time by virtue of being the protagonist. This bit where she hugs him, though, in those early days of Planet Ripple, I was worried people would ship Minnow and Kelsey together. Because he's an edgy white boy, and he used to be a bully, but now he's nice, and people just love that enemies-to-lovers crap. But there are many reasons a relationship between these two would be toxic, and I'm glad fans seem to have seen through that and have not shipped these two. On the next page, Minnow overhears a couple jerk faces bad-mouthing her, the captain, the merfolk, basically everybody, and the text is just atrocious. You don't see anything like this in other books. It's just one of those early growing pains. If I release a new edition of Volume 1 someday, I'll just use normal speech bubbles and maybe make the text a slightly different color. Though it does show us once again how cruel Planet Ripple's people can be. Captain Cyclops, Borg, Half-Girl, they can't go a few seconds without some kind of slur or disparaging remark. And Minnow just has to keep telling herself what Kelsey told her, they don't hate me, they just hate the captain. While Captain Nate was smart enough to heed Nook's warning, some people on the Bolina couldn't care less. This bit where a desperate Nook tries to warn them one last time to stay away from the island, it's our first actual glimpse at land. This is the first time we ever see an Ian Planet Ripple in person, it's, it's right there. And it's just out of the corner of our eye, right in our peripheral vision, so we're not quite there yet. Anyway, Nook gets captured trying to save these jerks, and then they get captured, and we get our first ever glimpse of a pirate. And boy, do they live up to Noak's description. We get to see a lot of pirates, including one of the Barracuda Army's most prolific, Hack the Apostle. Hack was an immediate fan favorite. When I was uploading pages of this book for free on platforms like DeviantArt, oh, people loved Hack. Overnight, he changed the tone of Planet Ripple, showed people what kind of story this was actually going to be. Villain introduction scenes are easy to mess up because it's easy to overplay your hand. There's been this gold rush of sorts to make the most over-the-top villains imaginable. I feel like it kind of started with Vaz from Far Cry 3. 
That character and the way that game was written really raised the bar for how charismatic, how commanding and, and entertaining and just terrifying villains could be in modern fiction. And ever since then, the writers of Far Cry have tried to recapture that magic, to recreate Voss with other faces at each game, and most of them kind of fall flat. But it's not just Far Cry, you see this in a lot of media, not even just other games, but TV shows and movies. Everyone's trying to make a character like that, to see how much you can sell a work based solely on the strength of personality of a villain. I guess you could say this new breed of bad guy actually began with Heath Ledger's Joker in The Dark Knight, but I don't know, that's still a slightly different personality type than I'm describing. And a lot of them just blur together for me, partly because they all use the same language, the same curse words, the same threats, and it's not like I'm against swearing. But when you're creating characters, you don't want them all to talk the same. An easy way to make characters feel like individuals is to just write their dialogue differently. It's almost like power creep. These writers just competing to make increasingly over-the-top versions of essentially the same character. It's just, it's a little embarrassing. Meanwhile, Hack carries such a threatening presence, communicates such vicious sentiments without ever uttering a single expletive. And I think that's a big part of what makes Hack so memorable. If Planet Ripple was like a, a kid's show, but Hack just stayed the same, oh my gosh, he'd be so entertaining. The way he speaks is so different from many other villains in his position. He's blunt and matter-of-factly, but a bit needlessly elaborate. It's just funny. His design also stands out in a crowd. Very clean and organic for this point in the series, even by pirate standards. As if he actually ripped open an ancient sea scorpion and made armor out of its shell. And it certainly helps that he has the power to back up his claims. You'll get to see more of Hack in the next chapter. But that's it for today. To support my work, check out my books on Amazon and itch.io. I just released Volume 8. There's also my Patreon page, where you can see videos like this a week early. Access patron-exclusive content, a patron-exclusive Discord server, art streams, the works. I'll see you next time on the Planet Ripple Logs with Log 5. Pieces. Doodles.